Welcome back to Mind of the Warrior, everybody. Doc with you here. As always, and as always, this podcast is brought to you by Graybeard Performance, the life and lifestyle brand for anybody who wants to continue to get after it and be a savage. Go to graybeardperformance.com. Check out our supplements, our jujitsu rash guards, geese, and all of our cool swag. Also, you can uh, check out my book, Honed, Finding Your Edge as a Man Over 40. Very pleased to have with me on the Mind of the Warrior podcast today from... The Great White North, Jeff DePazzi. Brother, thank you for coming on. Uh, pleasure's all mine, Mike. Uh, I felt like watching that intro, I was being pulled into the arena. We're stepping into the arena here. Right. So. Well, that's what I'm going for. So it sounds like it's working. <laughs> so let's let's jump right in. Let's uh, let's talk a little bit about about you, your background, your upbringing, uh, and and kind of just touch briefly on your on your military experience and what you're doing today. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, like you said, I'm from the Great White North. I'm from the latitudes that uh, I don't want to say civilization stops, but uh, it certainly <laughs> becomes much more dispersed and uh, even a little bit more tribal. Just a little spaced out. <laughs> just yeah, just a little bit more yeah. spaced out. Uh, that's how yeah. many interstates. Uh, yeah. yeah, and that 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 was like what started molding me. You know, we are an interaction between our environment and mm-hmm. our environment is an interaction with us. And that started shaping the character that I am. Mm-hmm. You know, I was uh, like many people end up in the operator field. I was a bit of an extremist, if you will, uh, mm-hmm. in terms of pushing the edges of who I am and where that led me. And uh, I won't go too far down those rabbit holes. They might, we might circle back to some of those adventures. Uh, and then, uh, Eventually, I got drawn into the military, you know, uh, infantry, airborne, and then into a tier one unit where I uh, spent about the better part of a decade. And uh, I was a sniper there, a breacher, a few other things. But uh, mostly once you get to those kinds of levels, you know, it, you change, especially in Canada, at least I won't fully talk for some place like uh, JSOC or something like that. Uh, you start working a lot more in plain clothes and working mm-hmm. with your other civilian counterparts. Um and then uh, one day I fell in love and uh, that changed everything as it often does. Mm-hmm. Uh, two of the great changers in life are extreme trauma or extreme love. And uh, mm-hmm. this uh, started catalyzing my exit out of the military. And that's when I was faced with a common dilemma of what do I do? You know, I spent all this time practicing and honing these these skills that I don't really want to use anymore outside of the military. So what do mm-hmm. I do with them? And uh started researching and working with men and seeing, okay, what are men missing in the, the more modern world? Where, where's the gaps? What's, what's not fueling their soul and why? Mm-hmm. And that led me to creating what's called the special forces experience. Um, more specifically a program called the process, which is a multi-phased uh, endeavor, which induces what I call intentionally facilitated post-traumatic growth. Mm-hmm. So I mentioned trauma on one end and then great acts of love on the other side. Mm -hmm. Uh, This one works with trauma to open people up, to alter their state of consciousness. And then uh, that gives them space to backfill it with new iterations of themselves to remove old behavioral patterns, Mm -hmm. uh, things of that nature. And as we did this, we discovered all these new and ancient forgotten tools to, um, well, being a man, Mm -hmm. uh, like as an overall statement, but being a human as well. And uh, we started to have this like huge amount of relevance realization that these tools are lacking in the world right now. We're not teaching people how to do these things. It's getting better. And there are people such as yourself, you know, putting out um, efforts um, all over. It's not totally unheard of. Uh, and this led us to moving into creating a documentary called the dark night of our soul, which is basically um, an intro for most people to post-traumatic growth. Cause very few people know what post-traumatic growth is. Most people mm-hmm. are very familiar with post-traumatic stress disorder or post-traumatic mm-hmm. stress state or mm-hmm. stress or anxiety. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but there is this whole other perspective available to human beings that tends to go unnoticed. And mm-hmm. so we took all our experience there, my life experience, but then we like started researching with scientists and esoteric trainers and healers, mm-hmm. uh, to start, threading and weaving this together this 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 beautiful concept of of hope and then taking it one step further into the realms of expanding your consciousness and then why that's important especially in this day and age where there's just a ton of there's almost always strife 
in existence, mm -hmm. right? But with 8 billion people on planet Earth and, you know, 2.3 billion of them are hungry. Mm -hmm. and everyone else who doesn't have needs met and, you know, deforestation and oceans, you know, I don't have to go down that. We know the chicken little story, right? We're, mm -hmm. we're marching in a direction that we don't know the outcome of. And it's because of us. It's because of our own psychology. And um, yeah, I would say that kind of has me sitting here and that's what I'm out to really talk about is those concepts um, with a, with a strong flavor um, towards um, something that we're starting called citizen green for veterans, which mm -hmm. is um, it's a research program. It's coaching and programming combined with medical cannabis mm -hmm. um, to travel through post-traumatic growth, um, but also as a transition plan for people leaving the military, not like the full plan, but to help mm -hmm. them begin to explore what their identity is, what their purpose is. Because uh, one of the things we notice about PTSD is there's actually a lot of different things going on, right? Like it's, it's a, they call it complex PTSD for a reason. It's mm -hmm. complex. And there's a lot of different factors that contribute to um, eventually leading to like an imbalanced non-coping state. Mm -hmm. and, um, so we're super excited about this because up in Canada, we're able to offer it to the veterans for free. Um, because our Veterans Affairs covers medical cannabis. So mm -hmm. if they purchase cannabis through our group called Santa, um, we're able to offer this programming for free um, mm -hmm. because Santa takes a cut, uh, not a cut, a hit. Um, and down in the US, uh, in a few months, we'll be launching it as well. Uh, we'll be able to offer, we're now about 30% discount, which is mm -hmm. what you know most vets are kind of chasing around. Um, and then in that, we'll be able to include the course and the community uh, and we'll be able to really start expanding this conversation um, as people try to sometimes get their head out of the water. And even for those who are, heads aren't under the water, it's a great way to, like I said, induce intentionally facilitated growth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, that kind of gets me to here. Yeah. You know, I love that you use the term post-traumatic growth because what something I think gets glossed over, and I think this is particularly true uh, you know, I, I don't want to I don't want to throw Gen Zers or millennials under the bus or anything, but uh, we didn't become the dominant species on this planet because of coddling. You know, there was it, evolution occurs because of trauma. And this is true as a species. It's true on the cellular level. You know, you go to the gym and you knock out a really hard workout. You're traumatizing your nervous system, you're traumatizing your musculoskeletal system, and then you develop and adapt to that. So there is growth that occurs because of that trauma. And we, we have, uh, we've come, you know, some people call it, you know, the bubble, the bubble wrap mentality, the helicopter mentality. We we've gotten in this mindset that we just so want to avoid trauma. And I, I don't think that in and of itself is the answer. You know, the, the answer certainly is uh, having tools in your toolbox to properly cope with that trauma. And we, you know, we know that if you have those tools, those that have those tools, because you can have, and, and I know you've seen this in your military experience, right? You have a unit of individuals and let's say, you know, even at the smallest level, the size of a 12 man team, you know, they might all go into that same exact traumatic experience and six of them, come out fine and six and they have good coping skills, six of them, maybe not as well. Uh, and I'm way oversimplifying that, right? Cause you know, in reality, you'll have those that kick the can down the road. Those that deal with it through dark humor. Those that deal with it through substance abuse, uh, various forms of coping, but trauma can be a growing experience. And I think, you know, it's, uh, here in the here in the U.S., you know, uh, President uh, President Bush, he was the first person that I ever say heard say, "I don't like calling it PTSD because you know it is post traumatic stress, but we shouldn't label it as a disorder because you can do something with that, and and you know you can you can you can go on and do great things, even having gone through the catalyst of that. So I I, I have a great appreciation for the for the phraseology post traumatic growth, and I think that's something that. Uh, more people, I think, need to be looking at, through, at it through that lens and working that into their lexicon. Yeah. Well, what it does is we automatically negate the option of hope. If we don't give the other side of the coin, if we just say there's just this non-coping state, you already mentioned it, stress and adaption models, you know, whether positive or negative energy, mm -hmm. um, you need to stress. That's, that, it is 
a fundamental yeah. character of the universe. That's how complexity is built. That's how yeah. we got to this point. Mm -hmm. um, what people don't understand, which gets tricky, is like a question of why, right? Um, like you mentioned, those people walking into a room, 12 of them will have a different experience. So the way we handle energetics, I don't really like to call it trauma mm -hmm. or not trauma. It's an experience that we can all metabolize and change and grow from. Uh, that, that, that's it. Um, what happens is people get stuck in their environments. They get stuck in their non-coping mechanisms, usually a lot to do with addictions, whether it's distractions or whatnot. And that just leads to a deeper and deeper level of discord. Mm -hmm. Like what I call ideality, which is your view of reality, and then reality. And the farther those are apart, the more discord you have. And the more discord you have, the less you're able to cope. Mm -hmm. uh, it's because of broken trust uh, within your space, right? You're, mm -hmm. You experience something where your nervous system is, I don't trust that environment. Mm -hmm. And it can take time to process. Some people, it happens very quickly. Uh, but there's steps you can take. Uh, an example, uh, I've read some research that says if you have REM sleep the night, like so you experience trauma and then that night you have REM sleep, you're 70% mm -hmm. likely, less likely to develop any PTS symptoms mm -hmm. just getting into REM sleep, let alone all the other physiological factors that you can do like drink water and all those mm -hmm. little things that, you know, Maslowian style needs that we mm -hmm. know of. Um, not to mention how you stress before. That's why an mm -hmm. operator is able to handle more load. You know, you mentioned a reverend mm -hmm. rumor and whatnot, but you stress your system intentionally. We called it training or preparing yeah. for an event that is unforeseen, right? We, all people should do this. And the thing is, is you, you kind of mentioned the bubble wrap society or whatnot. Um, I wouldn't necessarily blame the generation that's now. I would blame the generations before, but without a finger wag, more like, yeah, okay, you got us here. You got us here, yeah. but you set the conditions for this. You set the yeah. conditions for this. Um, but the responsibility is always on the individual. That's that's cut and dry. If people want to be a contributing, a healthy contributing member of society, everybody should look inside, face their shadows, mm -hmm. their non-coping mechanisms that come from childhood. So people get a little bit confused here because, you know, you brought up words like why and whatnot. Um, we are conditioned so much right our, our genetics then our epigenetics condition us and then our childhood condition us our life experience and most people haven't stopped to actually ask like who am i in this but if we responsibly go back to do that the tricky part is right now there's so much anxiety and people find it hard to find real excitement when there's a lot of anxiety around them right mm -hmm. everything is telling you you're inadequate if you feel inadequate then you feel like you're in a survival state if you're in a survival state your stress symptoms are just going to perpetuate because your body's mm -hmm. like, well, I got to be in a survival state. I'm not surviving. Right. Mm -hmm. They call it augmented survival where, um, you know, you're never enough. It's mostly on a material plane in the North right now. Cause there is some people around the world that are still in a pure survival state where they, they don't have groceries in their mouths and whatnot. Um, but I, you know, in our doc, we say trauma is something to be made an ally of. Mm hmm that's the only way you're going to get stronger. You, you mentioned the gym example. Right now, the world is like <laughs> getting pumped up like beyond belief. But it's time for people to start facing their emotional um, side as well, not just their skeletal muscular. Because really, you, you know, you don't need to lift 500 pounds to walk through a healthy life. You just don't. Like, and I'm not, I'm not like finger wagging at that either. It's like it's your own choice. It's just if you really want to move through the world in a less fear state and a more love paradigm mm -hmm. um, it's start it's you got to start looking at your emotions and the thing is is it's scary as fuck down there you know that's where you've stored you know deep in the hippocampus wherever you want to look the mm -hmm. things you couldn't face right those energy distortions whether it's getting in a room with 12 people and there's murders happening or you know a few times mom negates to show you love and attention and then all of a sudden you develop a coping mechanism that doesn't sit there because you were unable to sit with that energy so it distorts mm -hmm. you a little bit and it distorts you and over time those little distortions push people off their own individual trajectories you know mm -hmm. uh, we can call it like a soul's path or your psyche or just what your dna wants to fully manifest in you as and um what's happening more and more is we're kind of breeding people who don't want to face their shit more and more and they want to be distracted mm -hmm. more and more and it's it's creating this cycle right but that's that goes back to the whole thing the reason we don't know about post-traumatic growth is because it doesn't pay the bills right now um mm -hmm. our systems are old systems you know and it's time for these psychic psychological pillars that used to prop us up we need to start reevaluating them that's how mm -hmm. it's got to go 
We have to courageously do that. Um, and I think one of the, the most heroic things we could do, Mike, is begin to be the generations that say, okay, we're going to actually look at this and stop the cycles that we keep repeating as a species. Cause we don't really know, you know, like there's, there's a lot changing. We're moving our planet into a higher entropic state and we don't mm -hmm. know what the outcome of that is. Mm -hmm. You know, we're creating a lot of disorder in it where we think we're creating order. Um, we're actually creating disorder in the systems that nurture us. And that's a little bit scary. And um, like, who knows what the outcome of that is. Um, you know, we got people thinking we got to go to space and mine space and explore space to take the resource. And it's kind of like, isn't that what every enemy in every alien movie has ever done is gone and <laughs> harvested someone else's shit right? because they couldn't get their own shit together. Yeah. Uh, so it's kind of a funny little whirlwind we're in. No, it, it is. And, you know, uh, the self-reliance is an issue today uh, and uh, so much to unpack in the, in the things that we're talking about. But you talked about the the disparity that people have between reality and kind of their own version of events. And mm -hmm. I, I have uh, I, I've always been very resistant to the term that people use when, when people say my truth. Mm -hmm. I, I've always been somewhat resistant to that. Now, I, I've, I've, I, my, my position on that has evolved over time in that I acknowledge that, you know, everybody has a different point of view. Everybody, we, we don't have a 100% shared life experience. People look at, it thing, look at things differently. But I think everyone needs to recognize, especially people that are really quick to run to that term, we are all viewing the universe through a keyhole. And viewing the universe through a keyhole does not give you the complete picture. And you at least have to be open to the idea that we can open this door together and you can get a broader pers perspective on what's going on. And then we can all grow together because yeah. like you say, we need to kind of, we need to bring people closer to what the reality of the situation is. And I think, um, I don't think we do anybody, in my opinion, we don't do anybody any favors, especially from a mental health point of view, if we just let them kind of spin and, and continue that, that self-destructive cycle, you know, in, because of their truth. Uh, yeah. I don't think, you know, I, I think uh, in the short term, I think the, you know, people say, well, you know, I'm, I'm honoring them. I'm honoring their truth. I'm being respectful of them. And I think, no, the, 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 the truth of it is, you know, not to use that word too much is you just don't want to confront them and you don't want to be the bad guy in this. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, cause we've all had that family member that you have to have, uh, you know, the intervention meeting or, or something uh, of that nature. And it's, uh, they might hate you for it, but, but in the end, it, it's the right thing to do. Yeah. I, I like to think starting off with truth as a, a sphere, mm -hmm. you know, lots of things in the universe like to create in spheres, right? Mm -hmm. Planets, celestial bodies atoms mm -hmm. these things seem to be circular and i think of fundamental physics seems to have been the foundation depending on where you want to timeline it for how we are right it could be from the large down and it could be from the small upper as it almost always is it's both but i look mm -hmm. at it like that and most people's truth is very small and most mm -hmm. of what's packed into there has been conditioned into them and they haven't so they think it's their value set but it's actually not their value set that sits up top and this mm -hmm. value set programs for their attention to absorb the world in a certain way and that's why people are so addicted because most people have a low consciousness whether they want to admit it or not that's why they're addicted to things like trauma porn that's why they're addicted to bad news that's why they're addicted to these patterns because yeah. that's where their resonance meets it and they get they get fed it because yeah. those people who are feeding it are also caught in those patterns mm -hmm. and they think just that right the ego the ego doesn't like to say i'm wrong Mm -hmm. And it's a good survival mechanism until it's not. And right now is like the time where we got to start looking at it. And also like here in the West, we're kind of, you know, we spent uh, quite a bit of time fighting against what we would call like a collectivist view. You know, some mm -hmm. might call, you know, Marxism, communism, whatnot. So when we start thinking about that, lots of people backfill it. Implicit biases kick in and they backfill it with what they know, which is that. And that's just not what I think you and I are talking about here, because I think when the world is going to be its healthiest, everybody is fully going to express their individuality, mm -hmm. not be an individual. Like a lot of people think they are doing right right now, especially like up in Canada, we got this thing called liberal authoritarianism, which is just like, 
it's its own mucky situation that I, um, I don't really <laughs> want to get into, but like, they don't realize like you're just doing the same thing, but just from a different side of the coin. And yeah, um, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, no, I, I know, I know exactly where you're going and I don't, uh, that's our, that's a rabbit hole. We could spend a lot of time in, but it's mm. a lot of people who, uh, you know, they say the, the, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Uh, but it's, it's, it's not necessarily what you think your ideology is. Uh, a lot of times it's, you know, the mechanism by which you uh, implement that as you go through life. And I think people lose sight of that. Yeah. Well, I, I have some theories on it <laughs> just for funsies sure. uh, It's because people are addicted to fear-based patterns, mm -hmm. shame, guilt, apathy, yeah. uh, desire, anger, pride. Uh, and they don't really know what it means to love. A lot of people mm. think they know what that means, but usually what they're backfilling with is the loss of it. So mm -hmm. the fear of losing it is what they perceive as love. And it's a whole different paradigm. It mm -hmm. includes acceptance and neutrality. It starts moving one to thinking in um, um, more paradoxical views instead of just duality. Mm -hmm. And not even duality. You know, a lot of people, it's just one side of that dualistic nature. Uh, that's mm -hmm. what growth is. Growth is, is moving beyond your fears, you know, so that you're able to handle more of what's to come. Because, you know, you kind of alluded to this. One of the things... The universe is not done throwing us curveballs mm -hmm. and most likely it's only going to get more difficult. Mm -hmm. And if we don't start figuring out how to sort our own individual shit out, we're not going to conquer the universe here. You know, not saying it's against us. I think it's conspiring for us, but I think that conspiring is by the nature of evolution going to be challenging. That's just, mm -hmm. that's just how this math works. You know, this is just how it's been. It's, it's that simple. Yeah, no, it, it's it, it. Any any student of history will tell you that, uh, and anybody who tries to tell you otherwise is is trying to sell you a bill of goods. But no, I, I agree, and I think um, we have so much, so much competing with uh, with holistic health in in this day and age, and uh, not the least of I, I've as as much of a social media user as I am. I've railed against it. You know, that's because I think it can be, it can be a useful tool, but it has gotten to the point, you know, like you talk about it's uh, people, a crave conflict and B they crave uh, the, the dopamine hit of that affirmation that, okay, I called someone an asshole and uh, you know, 578 people, liked the tweet where I called somebody an asshole. So, you know, that's 578 dopamine hits that I got off of calling somebody an asshole. And, uh, it's, uh, in the end, it's, it's so self-destructive and it's so counter to not, you know, personal growth, societal growth. It's, it, it's really, I, I'm, I'm really interested to see, I, I wish I could look a hundred years in the future and see how they're going to talk about social media. And, you know, I, I, oftentimes I think that they're going to say, you know, this is when you know, the, the human race almost ceased to exist because of this thing called social media. Well, yeah, what we are doing is, um, some people, you know, don't have a faith in a God or a, a higher power or purpose, or even just in the universe anymore. Mm -hmm. And we put our faith into these algorithms that are developed by humans, right? Developed by <laughs> humans who are disconnected from their selves Mm -hmm. themselves and other people and they put their own inadequacies and their own um, biases yeah biases and insecurities mm -hmm. pr project them into these programs mm -hmm. i look at it though probably similar to you this is art of war stuff though because usually when something is presenting itself as this challenge mm -hmm. you know whatever through history insert historical example mm -hmm. it also can be the springboard for this new opportunity Right. And I think it's going to do that. You know, we have these self correction mechanisms, but I think the difference for people should be we're conscious beings. Mm -hmm. We're as far as we know, and I, I hope it's not this, we're the only people who are aware of a future. We're the mm -hmm. only animals aware of a future, really, you know, like dogs and stuff. They can kind of do it. You know, little birds can kind of do that, but we're the only ones who can impact how the atoms of, our time and space around us are going to land in the future. Mm -hmm. And that gives us a huge responsibility to start sorting this out. And, you know, I kind of feel like just as dangerous as social media. And part of it is this era of truly false idolhood um, mm -hmm. where 
we prop up these narcissistic people and we ask them to lead because they have a charisma that does something to the herd mentality, you know, because it's scary to step out of the herd. It courage is difficult to muster real courage, living from your heart, from, um, you know, I don't want to use the word your truth now, but where you think you should be mm -hmm. is difficult because it usually has you stepping outside of your old support paradigms. And that is that's scary turf, but that is step number one to learning how to view the world from a love paradigm. Yeah. And, um, you know, your, your, um, your podcast called mind of the warriors. And I think that's what it is. The warriors of the future are going to be warriors of love. And it's not like some hippie thing. It's just because it's going to be harder than anything. You know, Jesus was, was a crazy, uh, not crazy, but, uh, he was one of the greatest warriors of all time. You know, he was up against an empire that'll staple you to a cross, you know, and it please like for the religious people, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm being a bit like crass here, but like in, like we all agree that that most likely happened and that's crazy, you know? <laughs> And it's hard to stay in your truth there. Uh, but the trick is, we kind of touched on it, the paradoxical nature of reality says that your truth is also wrong at times. You mm -hmm. know, and it's like, where do you have the humility to step off of that? Because that's where most people don't really have it because they're so, they don't realize how insecure they are. Mm -hmm. So they, they, they cling to Joe, Mr. Jane, whatever, who makes 500 comments and sounds like they're right. You know, they cling to these things that are not really serving them in the long run and mm -hmm. certainly not serving our species in the long run. And this isn't doom and gloom. I think it's, it's an awesome time because we're more people are starting to press through the lower veils of consciousness and realize this stuff. You know, that's the beauty of awareness. This doesn't have consciousness doesn't have to be some um, nebulous term. It's just your ability to handle feedback loops through your sensory inputs in your body and your mind. And the more people do that, automatically they start having less kids automatically they treat the environment better automatically they're better for their community it just happens and mm -hmm. if we do this we'll start to uh, perpetuate a whole new direction for our our global collective if you will mm -hmm. yeah I, I, go ahead i was just saying at least i think so yeah yeah I, and i think part of the problem is to you know we're, we live in a society now where, uh, you know, I, I click on something on Amazon, it gets delivered to my house tomorrow. Um, people don't, uh, you know, uh, nobody makes a cake from scratch anymore, right? It's either, you either buy the cake already made, or maybe at most you buy a box of cake mix and, and you make it that way, right? So we're, we live in this very fast drive-through society where we're looking for shortcuts. And I think the problem, one of the, one of the problems with that is I think people on a subconscious level literally look for shortcuts to not think about things. So, you know, rather than do their own, you know, everybody, this became a really common phrase during the pandemic, right? Well, I did my own research, which was almost, almost universally a lie every time somebody said it. But I think rather than people doing a deep dive into, uh, whether it's history, whether it's, uh, you know, political issues, whether it's the environment, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, drug legalization, whatever, rather than do those deep dives and actually educate themselves, they're doing one of two things. Either they're data dredging things to look, they've already have a preconceived notion for the, So they're just, they want to reinforce their patterns. Yes. They're looking for that confirmation bias, yeah. or they look to someone that they idolize and they say, well, if Ron Perlman thinks this, you know, I, I kind of think he's a pretty cool guy. So he's probably done the research, you know, for, you know, forget the fact that he has an 82 IQ and, and has lived a sheltered life, uh, but they want to glom onto that. Like, you know, somebody who I respect for whatever reason, whether they're, a, you know, whether they can dribble a basketball or whether, you know, they look good because they've had 20 plastic surgeries and they, and they sell shoes, uh, they, they think this way. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to go ahead and think that way too. Cause it's just easier. I can just click on it and that's going to be my opinion. I'm sure they've probably done the research. And I think that's, I think that's part of the problem. Yeah. Well, we, um, we hand our power over to other people. We do yes. this often and I'm using the word. Yes. We, some yeah. of us do it way less, but we do that. We, we put, um, our security above our own from fulfillment. Mm -hmm. And so we put our power into other people mm -hmm. and, you know, sometimes that's a good thing. Like we're supposed to have leaders in the world right now. There's very few good leaders. Yeah. 
Most people let, really let me, don't know what that word means. Yeah, and yeah. I want to stop you on that real quick because I don't want to forget this. And it's funny that you said that because right before you did, I was thinking this. A pet peeve of mine has always been when people refer to politicians as leaders. Mm-hmm. I don't see anyone in elective office as a leader. I see everyone in elect. I, they, I see them as the equivalent of, uh, you know, my, my local sanitation manager. Uh, you know, there's someone who's been who we hired to do a job so we don't have to mess with it. But 99% of the people in elective office, at least here in the U.S., I wouldn't, I wouldn't follow down an escalator, uh, you know, to get away from a fire. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll, I'll just talk about that a little bit too. Uh, <laughs> so for the first time I'm applying for my residency here in the U S and I hope I get accepted. And Good for, for the you. first time Welcome. I just paid, I just paid some taxes here in the U S. So I feel like I can offer a little bit of an opinion, just a little. Mm-hmm. Okay. And, um, Well, you're saying leaders fall down a little bit of opinion on that. Oh man. Oh, give me one second. Just let me see if I can get back to it. Okay. Damn. All right. Oh yeah. I know what it is. I think, and this is just what I believe. Mm -hmm. So once upon a time, you guys threw a tea party for the Brits. Okay. (laughs) You know, now you're allies and whatnot, but what happened there is your your declaration of independence and your constitution were built and that actually changed the overall collective consciousness of the whole world yeah you know no one can argue that that moment in time changed it forever Mm -hmm. and i think what could be really fucking cool is this is the country that can really change the world right now it's not gonna be you know uganda it's not gonna be um people who can't motion things on a really strong level Mm -hmm. um and by and large, from my experience, most Americans are singing off the same sheet of music, roughly. Not all, of course. You know, we, we mentioned already a few people who have their, their own agendas and they're not mm-hmm. scared to serve their egos. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, what, what's kind of cool, you, you also mentioned the pandemic. The pandemic also showed us that uh, as nuts as it got, people went inside a little bit more and they saw mm-hmm. a few things. They're like, holy, I'm not a surviving machine. I'm not cut out. Like, I don't have... Uh, these tools, you know, and it started the first part of it, which was, um, you know, we teach and I'm mostly going to use the word warriors. I do love the word warrior. Uh, I think it's a very lost word. Um, Mm -hmm. We teach people how to fight, but what is not taught or at least by very few is why we fight. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the missing equation right now. And that's, that's where, you know, I'm, I know it's in there. I know men, men have a natural, natural, supernatural you know provide preside protect uh pleasure persevere those are natural masculine tendencies Mm -hmm. and most men want to vector it in a healthy way not all men want to vector it in an unhealthy way they just don't know why to do that where to Mm -hmm. point it you know um yeah (laughs) um as far as like the amazon thing you know technology is gonna be a part of our future and should be how and what we program into those algorithms, those variables, those codes really need to be reassessed because what's happening is a larger gap of insanity is building because Mm -hmm. we have these hyper um, rich people who control so much resources and so many mouths actually getting squashed downwards. And as long as that insanity continues, there's going to be like a crazy collective discord and um, I think it would behoove them before things get really bad is to start reassessing from that top down. Um, I don't know if that'll happen because like if shit, if the lights go out, I'm not going to go where someone has barely any resources. You know, you go to the, the person who has almost all the land in the world, all the money in the world, all these things, you know, like um, and there's only one of them. So they're, they're pretty easy to like move over top of, you know, um, but really, I think the question is simple. We all know there's problems. And the question is, how do I contribute to problem X, right? Mm -hmm. Um, How do I perpetuate this by by clicking on Amazon instead of going to the mom and pop shop? Now, we're so far past that, though. I can't go to a mom and pop shop. I can't go spend my time, pay double anymore. Like, it's just, it's we've moved past that. So there's got to be new and more viable solutions. You know, some of this, I know this might seem like... to to an American, but like maybe those things start to become social uh, companies instead of private 
and that money gets fed back into the system, you know, because what's happening is it's pooling, whether it's in Canada or whatnot, does China everywhere, it starts to pool in these areas and then they're able to move things and it just continues the cycle. Um, but again, like I say that, I, I don't think it's, it's bad enough yet. It's just there. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like we're all, we got food in our mouths. We're able to talk about it. Mm-hmm. You know, I go on a vacation now and then. So it's, it's like, okay, well, it ain't so bad, but uh, people forget a few things. One, the pacing of our lives um, is, is a lot, you know, and it's easy to see that because corporate burnout is the number one issue they face mm-hmm. because of the pacing and the stress, you know, suicide rates on the rise, you know, people disconnecting from themselves and others is this is all on the rise. Mm-hmm. So those are issues that we need to face because we are, you know, most of our brain not maybe not most, but a huge amount of it is designed for social interaction. That's how we find real pleasure. Look at how many people went insane during COVID. Yeah. You know? And instead of like opening their eyes, what happens is they move into a fear-based constricted mindset, very limbic, and they, they close node think, right? They just keep feeding in those lower perceptions, feeding mm-hmm. it in, feeding it in. Trust science. Okay. You know, so I'm not, you know, science is good. I, I, I'm mm-hmm. not throwing it out. It's done a lot for us and I don't want to throw it out. Um, but it's like, it's a reductionist platform best on based on like, you know, statistical perspective. It, it has its limitations too. You know, we, we, we can decide beyond just trusting these things. Anyhow, I'm, I'm, I digress a little on that, Mike. Um, yeah. It's all good. It's all good. Digressions <laughs> are good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> There's uh what, what was the impetus for you that, uh, made you take a look at this? What, what was your, what was your journey uh, that, that eventually arrived at this documentary? Yeah. Um, So a little something that I don't talk about too much is I've always been um, deeply questioning of like, why that question is very deep in me, but also um, I think I've maintained my intuition. I wasn't compressed down even though i went through the military and whatnot i managed to stay in tune with whatever part of my brain my body my soul whatever gives me good intuition and it does it creates a a source of me my timing is very good my my human reactions and interactions with that are not always perfect you know Mm -hmm. Uh, i do make a mistake or two here and there um but i i gotta like go back to being so i had these skills i was building right i thought I need to be able to fight fear. I need to be able to do anything. So I like, I'm good on a dirt bike. I can fly a plane. I can drive. There's almost nothing I can't drive or fly. You know, I I can Mm -hmm. shoot a gun, like no, any kind of gun, like nobody's business better than I'll ever need to. And you know, I I know hand to hand this and I know this and I know it could survive in the put like, um, so I, like we said, I think that's an important base layer, but then as soon as I discovered what real love feels like, it completely mm-hmm. opened up my mind to a whole new perspective and probability or a perspective of what is probable out there. Mm-hmm. And that really was the beginning of it. Um, but the decision to make it, so I, I, I mentioned the process, the, the program for the special forces experience. Um, as we were making it, we were approached by networks that wanted to turn it into a TV show. And I was like, you know what? I, I just don't want to, add to that noise. That's how I felt mm-hmm. about it at the time. If I'm being fully honest, uh, to me, it was just adding to the noise, uh, maybe a bit of shooting myself in the foot. Maybe I was a little bit nervous, you know, of doing a TV show or whatnot. Uh, and then one night we're doing, uh, the event. So the event is four phases, but there's, there's an eight day in person in person. Mm-hmm. And, uh, we're doing this thing late at night and we're sitting in a truck and we're following the group and there's myself, uh, Jess, uh, who's my partner at the time. And then Luke, Uh, Mm -hmm. who's our videographer. And I was like, you know what, why don't we make a documentary? You know, why don't we start there? And it, that's where the, we started to unravel it and unravel it. And then uh, we, you know, we entered in a small film festival. We got a couple laurels. Um, We were just starting small because I'd never done anything in this space Mm -hmm. other than watch movies and documentaries. And um, so there was a lot of learning, right? Just like everything in life, you know, you start off in the, uh, unconscious incompetence and then very quickly you become consciously aware of how incompetent you are um and that's the fun part uh so that that's what started that and then uh, a couple years ago i was like okay i'm just going to invest my own money i think this this needs to get out 
um, the messaging of it. And I think you have uh, the, the trailer queued up there. I do. Yeah. Thinking. So let me, uh, I'm, I'm semi-technologically illiterate. So let me see if I can do this. <laughs> well, that means you're semi-literate though. Right. <laughs> All right. Here we go. You, as you know yourself, are not the final term of your being. Is the sound coming through? Yep. Okay. It's difficult to move through trauma and times of intense change and suffering. I think trauma can show itself in very subtle ways in which we feel disconnected from feeling alive, what it means to be here. We're in survival mode right now. And this results in our behaviors that could amplify our situation. I wonder where it will take us now, how the trauma affects the people, how the trauma affects the planet, potential future. And I think, I wonder what's gonna be left over there. There's always trauma. Nobody, Nobody gets, gets out of the parking lot without, without putting a in the car. But trauma, trauma offers not just, just something, something to be defeated, but something, something to be made an ally, uh, something, to something to learn from, from something, to, something to pass through. Maybe, that maybe the, the symptoms aren't the symptoms something, aren't something you have to stamp out or get rid of. Maybe those are part of it. Trauma, trauma, post trauma. How do we grow from it? How can we grow from it? Can you grow from it? It is the next frontier of humanity. It is the current frontier of humanity. Because. Things, things falling, falling apart is how, how things build back up. That's, That's happening right now. Right, right now. now. Something profound is going on. It's enhancing this relevance realization, this connectedness. We need stress, right? We need pain. We need all the things that we suffer from. To connect biology and behaviors and mental health and view a human being as a holistic existence. I think we're on the cusp of some very serious confrontation with ourselves and with our nature and with the way that we've moved in the world. Not a revolution, but involution and evolution. The dark times of my past actually has prepared me to be the man that I am today. The essence of post-traumatic growth is the possibility that you can take the experiences you've had and you can use those to connect and to share and to become more human, more connected to the people around you. Hmm. Really powerful. So a couple of things that, uh, that, that really hit me about that. My, my wife, Denise is a, is, is a, uh, life and leadership coach and where she differs kind of in her approach from say a traditional therapist is uh, she doesn't, you know, a therapist will always have you go back and, and relive those traumas and kind of dwell on that as a starting point. And coaches don't do that. And I think for a, a lot of reasons, I think that's why people to are tend to turn to coaches a little bit more now. Um, but uh, I, I saw that as a theme throughout this trailer that you know you can't change those events that happened. Those those happened, and you can either utilize you you can't forget it, you can't you can't negate it. You know it happened. It's there. It's a part of you. So you have to use it. You really do. And I think that's uh, that's such a powerful message that people can use that. They just need to be shown how. Yeah. So. <sighs> I think it goes without saying, but I'm going to say it. Obviously, this is never a negate or a, a sidestep that someone mm -hmm. should impose their will on someone else. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like nobody should ever be like, yeah, I raped you, but it's for your good. You know, like that's not what we're talking about. We're talking right. about the right. breaking the cycles that create that kind of mentality in the first place. Mm -hmm. But if it does happen, how do you rebuild trust in mm -hmm. the world around you? Trust in your body. Mm -hmm. How do you tune up your nervous system and move it back into an alignment where you can move through time and space in a healthier way? And then also, you know, forgive and expand. Like these are all different tools that happen. And like you, you mentioned therapy. So in normal CBT, you know, it's, it's about moving someone to a normative scale through revisiting and revisiting and trying to make it normal that way. Mm -hmm. um, it does have its place, certainly. Mm -hmm. um, but here's an interesting story. You know, we were, we, uh, 
we interviewed an, an older fellow, an old military guy. He was, he was like in his 80s. He died since, uh, since you know, maybe a year after filming or whatnot. But he was adamant mm-hmm. that you don't do that. You know, so he was, uh, he was a therapist and a psychologist and all those things and had a few different titles. And he was like, you can't do that. And one of his examples was in the Korean War, out of all the the PWs, the ones that came back from the Korean War were the most messed up. Mm-hmm. They were the hardest to bring back. Now, not everybody comes back from their 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 own dark night. Some people get left behind, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Um, but they were the hardest. And what was interesting is they didn't use torture. You know, they didn't use waterboarding. They didn't use methods that you would think. What they did is they just had people revisit why they were inadequate. You know, they had them revisit these moments and then they would do things like uh, um, have them read bad. Like if they got bad news in the mail, they would just have mm-hmm. them replay it and replay it. What are you doing? You're just crystallizing your neural pathways if you're doing mm-hmm. that, you know. Um, so, yeah, the, the tools that are there, like it, it, it's a yes end. Um, mm-hmm. you, I think it can help to know those those genesis points. Mm-hmm. Um but it's not necessary. You know, you can use plant medicines. Um, you can use uh, positive psychology moving forward. You know, you can encompass mm-hmm. new things. But you can do is you can start to identify your non-coping ma- mechanisms in this space mm-hmm. and then start to adjust those behaviors. And it automatically starts to remove the old patterning. It, it just happens. And then, you know, I don't know um, if there's vets or anyone with PTSD really listening. We interviewed a lot of different people. Mm-hmm from shamans to you know physicists to the whole gamut of people who have something to weigh in on this and the first thing that happens and it's a combo is the first step whether you're doing ketamine or whatnot is you interact with another human so when people constrict down they usually stop interacting with people that's the first thing and they'll start Mm -hmm. pushing them away so maybe like you're still in the house with a wife or vice versa but usually they get pushed away Mm -hmm. Um, so it does that. And the second thing it does is it engages a prefrontal cortex. That's already probably starting to shut down more and more, you know, starting Mm -hmm. to calcify or be under use or whatnot. And we need to do those two things, right? We need to goal set to move towards a goal. And then just the healing power of talking with someone else is amazing because, um, making meaning is important, but Mm -hmm. I think rebuilding trust is more important. And that happens when you talk with someone else, when they normalize it. Oh, Mm -hmm. okay. Like, believe me, I'm not a therapist. I'm not any of this. I'm not, I'm actually not a coach, but um, I do, I have explored a lot of these things. Um, You start to normalize it. You start to make it normal in their mind. Then they can start to navigate it, right? Because it wasn't normal when it happened. It was so abnormal that it disjointed them forever. You start Mm -hmm. to normalize it and make them feel safe in their body. You know, like, the container of love, real love, not from a judgmental perspective, you know, that that's what happens with therapy. It's not really a, not all therapists, of course, it's not really a container of love. It's a container to find out what the fear pattern is. And if you just keep playing that out, um, it can be very much a broken record. And um, I think that goes into a little bit of what I touched on earlier is lots of this coaching space is working amazingly. You know, mm-hmm. there are these modalities that are they're changing lives, changing lives, but they're not covered by insurance. They're not covered by government grants. They're not covered by our traditional systems that cover these things. Mm-hmm. And until we really figure out how to to do this, it's going to be an uphill battle because um, usually those people, not always, but it's a place of passion and that's what keeps keeps it going. You know what I mean? It, it, it's a trickier not an impossible, but a definitely a trickier business than uh, mm-hmm. falling into one of the normal systems and patterns. Yeah, it, uh, it's. I mean, it's in the news all the time uh, down here, and I, I'm sure it's probably similar in Canada. I I think uh, our the 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 VA VA healthcare for the most part is broken, and if if I had to scale which part of VA healthcare is the most broken, it would be mental health. Uh, that's where mm. I, and it's gotten better, but it, I mean, it really had to, it had nowhere to go, but up. And, and unfortunately, I mean, the, the, the horror stories that I've heard uh, 
from, from troops, from guys that I know, it, <clears throat> I mean, it's just the, the whole approach to it is it, it's actually a lot like you're talking about with the Korean POWs. It's every, every single appointment is them just reliving the same trauma again and having to talk about it again, especially when it comes to the point that, you know, if, if, uh, if you change providers, right, because, you know, somebody moved or, or they just, they moved you over to somebody else because uh -huh. of patient load first appointment, what do you have to do? You have to go in there and relive it again. And I remember I did, uh, when I did my psych rotation, I went to the, uh, to uses, which is the military medical school, uh, here in, in the U S and so I did all of my rotations at military hospitals and to include a psych rotation. And of course, on the psych rotation, one of the things that we were doing quite a bit was dealing with people who had just come back from the war, you know, going in the way. And, and they were typically they were in the wards with some type of physical injury. But we were also addressing, uh, you know, their emotional and psychological needs. And I remember going and talking to these guys and I'd say, hey, you know, are you know, are you allowed to go outside? You know, do you smoke? Do you, I don't smoke, but you know, a lot of them did. I'm like, Hey, do you smoke? You want to go outside and we'll just talk, we go out to a picnic table. I wouldn't ask them. I'd already read their file. I wouldn't ask them anything about the traumatic event. I would ask them, you know, Hey, what are you doing now? Are you, you know, are you, who are you communicating with at home? What, what's next for you? And, uh, one and I did, that's the way I always did it. And then one day I had one of the one of the troops say to me, he goes, you know, you're the only person who has uh, has a, everybody else has had me relive, you know, the night that this happened. And I don't want to relive that anymore. You're the only person that asked me, how do I feel right now? And what are my plans for next month and next year? And I said, well, you have to look. I mean, the whole purpose of us even talking to you is to equip you going forward. So to me that, you know, if anything, 80% of the concentration on every session should be on that. And I think, uh, you know, there, there have been some great strides in mental health, especially in the military over the last 20 years. But uh, again, it was so broke to begin with that the only way that it could go was up, in my opinion. Yeah, I, a bunch of things come up there. You know, as long as we reward for the wrong things, this is what's going to continue on. Mm -hmm. um, we. we people have to learn how to be in the present as well. That's mm -hmm. one of the things, mm -hmm. right? As long as we're in the future, we're actually stressing, you know, we're, we're adding a load on our right. brain, right? Cause it's, a, and cause it's, it's good. an unknown. Yeah. It's an unknown. It's good mm -hmm. to do this now and then, but as long as we're not in the present, if we're in the past or we're in the future, our body's going to be taxed at a whole different level. So, mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, with positive psychology, you know, what is it you want to do? How do you want to move forward? Those kinds of questions are super important. I think people get a little like thrown off because, they, they forget that also sometimes you got to plunge your hands into the muck. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You got to, you got to, you got to retax that system a little bit. And um, I think a big part of it is if we just reframe, especially for, you know, I, I, I get it. I was diagnosed with severe PTSD. I didn't like being called broken or bent. I didn't like being called, if we call it a survival mechanism, maybe, mm -hmm. and a chance to adapt and be stronger and expand, which it totally is, mm -hmm. you know, not as this handicap. You know, not as nobody wants really to, I don't think anybody, I won't say nobody, I don't like to talk in absolutes, but I don't think anyone wants to be dubbed as broken or handicapped or whatnot. Um, it does get vastly more uh, difficult for those with physical injuries um, because those are going to just be with you forever, most likely. But uh, you saw a black gentleman named Paris in uh, the documentary uh, trailer. Mm -hmm. He was shot, paralyzed from the neck down. You know, that that's that's where he was while he was in that state in the hospital. His mom died. The only support system he had, you know, mm -hmm. like all these things. Oh, yeah. He also had a drug addiction. So he had to kick his heroin addiction while he was going through all this. Mm. But on the other side, he found a way to use this. Um, like he says, he says, I, I this wheelchair is now a platform for me to help other people. And that, that that's that's the forgotten art mm -hmm. is if you do go through that shit. You know, that's the, the hero's journey. If you dip into the underworld, the idea is to bring the elixir back to the community, you know, um, and sometimes your sacrifice is greater than others. And yes, you know, as we clean this up, we'll get less war wounds because we won't go to war as much. You know, these, these other factors will start to work themselves out and it will, it will never be utopia, but it'll, mm -hmm. it'll, we'll, we'll be able to mitigate some of those, um, those factors, um, 
Yeah, they, our Veterans Affairs up in Canada is very similar. Um, they're trying, uh, but I think they forget this. You go through basic training and then some kind of like whatever MOID or whatever you guys call it, um, mm-hmm. like a like a trades training. Yep. And then you go through training iteration after training iteration and possibly you go through deployment training and then you deploy and all these things happen where basically you're being hammered on into what the military wants you to be mm-hmm. most likely for years, you know, layer on all the, the injuries and coping mechanisms and whatnot you brought into that. And you hammer that person down, even if they don't experience things to undo those energies on the other side, take a long time. Like there's a lot of guys who get trapped in being a soldier for 20, 30 years, if they're ever able to give it up, you know? And it's like, mm-hmm. okay, you were that, but you can grow much beyond that and Mm -hmm. that doesn't like you take the skills that really serve you into the future and the experiences that serve you but you know just on a cellular redevelopment um point of view you know like we're 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 recycling cells enough that you don't have to take that on a biological level with you even you know you can start reprogramming these things and um so instead of like kind of kick to the curb or like a short-term thing i think it would be very beneficial um for anyone to have a long-term term transition plan, but you know, veterans of first responders, veterans of the military to have this, like this huge transition cycle. I don't know what the exact amount would be, but we all mm-hmm. know behavior change take time. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a lot when you're kind of like out and then all of a sudden, I mean, we all know one of the coping strategies you take from the military is drinking You know, a lot of people drink. And so you add that Mm -hmm. into the mix and then all of a sudden drugs come in and then distractions and whatever. And it's like, it can be a, there's, there's a reason you see so many homeless begging on the side of the street that say veteran in need, you know, um, it's, it's not surprising. It it shouldn't be surprising. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, you know, I think we're working on that's citizen green, the program that uh, I mentioned early on, that's Mm -hmm. what we're looking. We're trying to bridge that gap. Um, with all these things we're chatting about where if you need access, you'll, you'll find access, uh, but more from a coaching perspective than a therapy perspective. Um, kind of like uh, what your, I don't know what it's called down here, but up North we have what's called legions. Right. And mm-hmm. that's where like the veterans can go and they can. Yeah. Yeah. We have, see here we have the, we have VFW. Uh, we have the, uh, the, the American Legion, foreign Legion, uh, or we have the American Legion, the VFW, uh, and there's one other one that's escaping me, but yeah, we, okay. we have And the idea is like you go and you talk and, you know, it's usually mm-hmm. you're trying to have fun. You have some drinks and whatnot, uh, which is it's, it's own community. It's got, it's, 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 it's long-term um, benefits could be weighed and measured and rethought out, but mm-hmm. stuff like that. And then what we add in is we add in medical cannabis used uh, in a much more specific way than just a numbing agent or mm-hmm. something to modulate pain mm-hmm. where, the idea of these altered states, it creates like a high entropy state in your mind, which just opens the possibility for new connections, new ways of thinking, mm-hmm. mostly new ways of metabolizing emotional states and things of this nature. And you mm-hmm. use that in conjunction with all these other like tried and true um, methods because, uh, you know, we've been human beings for a long time now, so we know a lot of ways to be really solid human beings, you know, we, we mm-hmm. still read quotes from Marcus Aurelius, you know, and whatnot, because that human, it still holds true today. You know, we, we just, mm-hmm. um, kind of find it a little bit more difficult. And, and, and like, of course, all the things with non-judgment and whatnot. Um, just one of the things that I think is, um, forgotten about is actually restressing your nervous system. You know, there's this really cool thing that happens if, you know, if you're locked into PTSD, most people, if you go in and you start really, you know, I'm going to be a bit like exaggerative here, but if you start choking them, they're going to attempt to fight for their life. You know, that's what happens. Very few of them are just going to roll over and die. Now that does happen, you know, such mm-hmm. a deep apathetic state that uh, they're just ready to roll over. Um, but that's, what's cool about actually stressing the nervous system when it's taxed like that, it, it can open up a gap. It's not a long-term solution. It's just part of the cycle that can be, um, help people open up to new possibility, but it's so hard, right? When you're locked down, very hard to step into the unknown, you know, that Mm -hmm. mysterious realm where you've never been before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, 
Jeff, I appreciate you coming on. I appreciate you sharing all this with me and with my listeners. Where can people find more about Citizen Green? Where can they, when is the documentary out and where can they watch it? Yeah, so the documentary, you can follow us at uh, posttraumaticgrowth.film. Um, what we're doing is we're moving into a, a Kickstarter campaign May 15th and we're going to be airing shorts plus okay. having a panel on discussions to raise up the last bit of funds we need to just take this thing um, through its uh, all the way through to uh, its end. That'll culminate on June 15th, which we're trying to call, we're trying to dub post-traumatic growth day. So that okay. it's within PTSD month, which is June. Um, and then you can go to the special forces and you can find info on citizen green, uh, whether you're American or Canadian, um, like I said, we're going to be uh, coming down north, uh, south very soon with this program. And uh, through that, you can find pretty much everything uh, that we got kicking around. Awesome. Well, I'll, I will have links to everything that Jeff mentioned in the show notes. So make sure that you check all of that out. Uh, this has been a great talk, Jeff. Is there anything you want to add before I sign us off? Um. Again, I, I haven't combed through all your listenership, but I, I would imagine there's a few vets in there and like, uh, you know, we're really not alone in this, you know, it just yeah. feels that way. Um, and uh, all that, you know, right now, just start the link by going down the rabbit hole. Yeah, no, 100%, man. And I tell people all the time, there's a thin line between rugged individualism and isolating yourself. And, you know, yeah. you didn't, you didn't stack up and go through that door all by yourself and you don't have to face what you're dealing with now all by yourself. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, I, everybody, I am going to leave you today with, uh, I, since, uh, Jeff mentioned Marcus Aurelius, but I quoted Marcus Aurelius in my last podcast that I just recorded. So I can't quote him again. So I'm going to close out with a quote from the Austrian Oak, Mr. Arnold Schwarzenegger, who said, strength does not come from winning. Your struggles develop your strengths. When you go through hardships and decide not to surrender, that is strength. Remember that, everybody. And until next time, live life like a warrior.